The first attempts to actually use genetic information in living humans to inform us about our evolutionary past really started in the mid-1980s. This is when sequencing technologies had developed to the point where we were able to more readily get large samples of genetic data, even just basic genetic data from human populations. And the first target for understanding paleogenetics was mitochondrial DNA. Now recall that your mitochondria are organelles within your cells that are involved in the production of energy. But mitochondria actually contain a very small amount of their own native DNA, mitochondrial DNA. Now the structure of this DNA is very much like bacterial DNA. Rather than the complex double helical structure that our nuclear DNA has, this is simple rings of DNA and very short. The complete mitochondrial DNA is just a fraction, a tiny fraction, of what our autosomal or nuclear DNA consists of. So they're very small, there's multiple copies of them in each cell because we have lots of mitochondria in each cell, so they're very easy to sample, very easy to get sequence data from, or at least relatively more easy. Additionally, mitochondrial DNA are passed complete from parent, or in this case from mother, to offspring. There's no recombination that occurs within mitochondrial DNA, meaning it doesn't get shuffled up from each generation to the next, making it more readily available or more readily accessible to reconstruct past patterns out of mitochondrial DNA. The pattern of variation is simply simpler because it doesn't undergo recombination. Finally, one additional element is that it was thought that mitochondrial DNA would be more impervious to natural selection. Recall that selection can do lots of different things with patterns of variation. So trying to mitigate the effect of selection on genetic patterns makes it much easier to try and reconstruct what those patterns are. So because mitochondria are so essential to the functioning of a cell, any mutation that would give rise to a functional variant was by and large thought to be negative and would have been selected out very quickly. Indeed, when we have mitochondrial functional variants, they're oftentimes lethal variants where that mutation never even reaches actually a full pregnancy and that it's very lethal early on in the context of a pregnancy. So it was thought that they'd be resistant to selection, they are very simple DNA, and as actually it turns out, have a rapid mutation rate, which helps as well. And so they are a natural target to begin looking at to reconstruct paleogenetics. And when researchers started doing this in the mid to late 1980s, they uncovered something that at the time seemed very remarkable. If you looked at patterns of mitochondrial DNA variation across living populations, it turns out they coalesced very recently in our past. And it turns out the estimates they got off those initial studies were somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200,000 years in our past, and that the deepest roots of this evolutionary tree, this evolutionary phylogeny for mitochondrial DNA, was in Africa and it gave rise to the notion of mitochondrial Eve. Recall again that mitochondrial inheritance is maternal, from mother to, to offspring. So the notion of mitochondrial Eve was that all of our mitochondrial variation, all the variation within living human mitochondrial DNA today across all populations, coalesces to a single population in Africa sometime about 150 to 200,000 years ago. This observation was critically important in what developed then in the 1990s in terms of our understanding of modern human origins. The idea that this was a speciation event that occurred in Africa very recently was critical to the idea that humans as a species evolved very recently within Africa. That we're simply the most recent evolutionary human to exist and that we subsequently came to expand and replace pre-existing populations. So that 150,000 year time window is sometime around the age of this specimen, Herto from Ethiopia, which we'll be talking about more. But the idea of mitochondrial Eve, again, was that there was a speciation event that occurred late in the Pleistocene, that this small population that evolved someplace in Africa then began to rapidly expand, outcompete, and replace all pre-existing populations, and gave rise to the human species as a result of a recent speciation event. Now, as we'll see, this picture from mitochondrial DNA, while not incorrect in terms of how we interpreted the observation, might be incomplete in how we interpret the total picture. Since that time, we've developed much more advanced genetic sequencing technologies, which have allowed us to look at much more of the genome than simply the small fractional mitochondrial DNA. And it turns out the picture we've received from this more advanced studies is far more nuanced than what we have with mitochondrial DNA. But the discovery of mitochondrial Eve, perhaps as misleading as that title might be, was critical to the development of 1990s paleoanthropology, particularly the issue of modern human origins, and whether or not modern human origins was the product of a very recent speciation event.